Mr. Mayor, do you acknowledge that you made false statements? That is a total you, lie. Why don't you go put yourself somewhere now? But you now? acknowledged it. Why did you I not did fight not that in the court? I acknowledge then? it. That was a stipulation that's done in every lawsuit, not for the purposes of truth. You did not, or law, you did not contest now, it. You had the opportunity that. to fight that. Wrong. Well, I did not because I had to move on to legal issues. Rudy Giuliani surrendering today in Atlanta, now part of Trump's rogues gallery of Georgia co-defendants who are being booked, fingerprinted, and getting lovely mug shots to place above their mantles, courtesy of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. Also tonight, stunning news out of Russia as Yevgeny Prigozhin, the man who led the June mutiny against the Kremlin, is now believed to be dead in a plane crash. Plus. Debate night in Milwaukee. Trump won't be there. Can any of the others prove that they are a legitimate threat to his renomination? Well, we begin tonight, however, with the truth and consequences. The truth being that there was no widespread voter fraud during the 2020 presidential election and that the actions taken by Donald Trump and his gang took a long walk off a short pier going from the legal to the criminal. That leads us to the consequences that we are now seeing play out this week as one by one, the 19 co-defendants in the Georgia case are making their way to a Fulton County jail to surrender. As you can see, in place of some of the headshots that we've been showing you since the indictment came out, are the mugshots of those who have already been booked. Trump's headshot remains on that graphic, but likely not for long, as he is expected to turn himself in tomorrow night in prime time, to put on a performance for his MAGA followers to make it seem like he is the martyr he claims to be, to get his followers, of course, to send him money. But let's just deal in truth for a minute, shall we? Because no matter what kind of performance Trump puts on for his followers tomorrow night, this has to be legitimately distressing for the man who has gotten away with so much throughout his life and who has rarely had to truly face the consequences. Tomorrow night, during this very hour, Donald Trump will be humbled before the world as he finds out how humiliating it is to go from being the leader of the free world to being photographed like a common criminal. No matter how much bravado he displays, there is no way that Trump wants to join this cast of previously famous politicians who in some cases smile for the camera as they too faced up to their crimes. For a lot of these people who exist on the elite side of American politics, Booking Day is likely both a shocking and a sobering moment. And it may be a wake-up call to just how real the consequences are in the criminal justice system. Trump's co-defendants could very well be looking at prison sentences for following the direction of a man who likely could care less what happens to them as long as it keeps him out of prison. Don't believe for a second that Trump wouldn't throw every single one of them under the bus to save his own behind. We've already seen reporting to that effect. And if it wasn't clear enough, Trump's defense lawyer started laying that groundwork earlier this month, putting the blame on everybody but Trump. Everything that President Trump did was with the advice of lawyers and counsel. What he's being indicted for ultimately is following legal advice from an esteemed scholar, John Eastman, that he could petition his own vice president and ask his vice president to pause the voting on January 6th to give the states one last chance to certify or re-audit. Joining me now is Harry Littman, former deputy assistant attorney general and host of the Talking Feds podcast. And Lisa Rubin, MSNBC legal analyst. Thank you both for being here. Lisa, I do want to start with you. Um, you know, watching Rudy Giuliani come out today and do that sort of, it was almost sort of hysteria because, you know, he doesn't normally talk anymore to normal news outlets. And so getting the chance to ask him questions, Vaughn Hilliard shooting some questions at him. Um, he seemed rattled to me, um, having watched Giuliani when he was mayor. Um, there's his mugshot. It's got to be a humbling moment to go from being a, a U.S. attorney uh, to being mayor to being that, right, C photographed in that way. Talk a little bit about it, because I can only imagine how sobering it is. This is date. This is it, it gets real. This is when it gets real, when you take that mugshot. It totally gets real. And there's no place, Joy, that's more real than the Rice Street Jail in Fulton County, Georgia, Amen. where multiple people have died in custody already this year. This is a place 
where conditions are, to use a word that has become infamous, deplorable, frankly. Mm -hmm. And for Giuliani to have to walk through that jail and be processed like anybody else in Fulton County, Georgia, had to not only be humbling, but humiliating. It's a sad, it's a, if, if the story were to end here, and it won't, it would be a sad enough ending for a person who was once called America's mayor for the leadership he showed in the days immediately after September 11th. I mean, and, and you know, this is a jail that the feds have looked into. I mean, right, it is a, it is a rough place, right? And, you know, Harry, for me, you know, and we can put up some more of these mugshots. I mean, some of them look more pathetic than others. Jenna Ellis, I guess, decided to do hair and makeup. There she is. Uh, she decided to try to look, look cute for it. But you can try to look cute all you want. You know, this, these are attorneys, Harry. These are people who went to law school. I can only imagine how proud their parents were when they got those law degrees. And for them now to be defendants, it, it is something that is so sobering that I wonder if, if you know, for you as a prosecutor, if, if you can foresee some of these people rethinking how hard they're going to fight for Donald Trump's reality, because Donald Trump's not going to fight for theirs. They, he's going to throw every single one of them. He's already said it's it was Eastman's idea. It's, you know, it's easy for him to say, no, that was Cheeseboro's idea. That was Eastman's idea. He doesn't care about these people. So I wonder if you've experienced when people finally have that moment where they're taking that picture, there's the Kraken lady, um, that they say, you know what? Yeah, this ain't worth it. I'm going to try to help myself and not help Trump. That's it, exactly. And I'll add to humbling and humiliating and sobering, terrifying. You take a step into that kind of booking um, environment and you contemplate that being your residence, maybe for the rest of your life. It focuses the mind on your own self-interest right quick. So we're seeing that already. This is a very sort of dynamic time in the Fulton County um, proceedings themselves, Joy, in which Ken Chesbro, uh, Jeff Clark, Mark Meadows, David Schaefer have all made efforts to one or way or another, get themselves out of it, and in, in other than just towing the line for Donald Trump. So for Trump, it's a very dangerous time, and you add to that that for most of them, they don't have the money to for the uh, exorbitant bills of defending themselves, and Trump isn't giving it to them. He, more than anybody, is at risk over the next couple weeks of having people show up to Fulton County and say, OK, I've got some things to tell you, and they're about the former president. Let's make a deal. Yeah. And by the way, I, I will know, and we'll, we'll go through, we'll tell you, some, some people, we don't know what they looked like before we've seen them in the mugshot. For your first right. time, really, for people to know what you look like, for that to be your image, you know, it's it's pathetic. You know, the, the Eastman one is particularly pathetic. I, I will note, um, Lisa, that so Mark Meadows tried to make this not happen. Yep. He, he tried to go to, the, you know, so did Jeffrey Clark, the former Justice Department official. They were like, don't let this be me. I don't want to be arrested and take this monk shot. A judge said, sorry, no. Uh, Meadows' uh, motion was immediately, he wanted to remove his case to federal court, prevent his arrest until after the evidentiary hearing on August 28th. Uh, the judge said no. Clark's motion was to stay the proceedings and stave off his arrest while he tried to send the case to federal court as well. Judge also said, sorry, no. They're going to have to go through that indignity, too. Yeah, they are. They're both going to have to be arrested. And, you know, Joy, it's not – Katie Turner and I were talking about this earlier today. Being booked is not like going on an airplane ride where there's one line for the special customers right. and one line for everybody else who's seated at the back of the plane. It's more like showing up in an emergency room. Yeah. And you get to see whatever presents itself at the jail that day. If there are a cacophony of defend other defendants who are there, you wait in that line with everybody else. And Harry is right. It is a harrowing journey from start to finish. I wonder how much time Rudy Giuliani spent at the MDC, the Metropolitan Detention Center in downtown Manhattan when he was the U.S. attorney there. But that itself is a facility that was so bad that it was shut down. Now he's getting to see 
the inside of conditions where he has himself placed people before. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let, let's bring in Luke Broadwater, the New York Times congressional uh, reporter. Luke, I, I wonder if there is any reporting on kind of the ramifications beyond what we saw today. Uh, we know that uh, Donald Trump is throwing a hundred thousand dollar ahead fundraiser for Rudy Giuliani, which is probably smart, where he wants to keep him on side, uh, because if he decides that he's no longer standing with Trump, he would probably have a lot to say. But are there any reverberations from Eastman world, from Jenna Ellis world, from people who uh, might be getting a little shaky after their experience in Fulton County today? Well, both Eastman and Jenna Ellis say they're going to fight the uh, charges um, and they're you know, condemning the, the prosecutors. But Jenna Ellis has also complained about Donald Trump not paying her legal, legal bills, and she's been quite outspoken about that. Rudy Giuliani was trying for months and months to get Donald Trump to pay his legal bills. He had wanted something like $20,000 a month, and Trump had essentially refused to pay him despite entreaty after entreaty to try to get these legal bills paid. And finally, now, when he showed up at, at the jail, uh, is Donald Trump saying he's now going to try to help him with the legal bills. That's in stark contrast to some of these other lawyers. You know, Donald Trump has paid millions of dollars to other attorneys who I think he valued more or thought could help him more. He had sort of thrown Rudy away, it seemed. And I think that does present a risk. Uh, you know, when you're talking about trying to get co-defendants to testify or to provide evidence to the prosecution. I do believe one of the mugshots that we've gotten today is the woman who uh, was running the Coffee County Election Office and allowed people to uh, uh, get into the machines there. Uh, she had a GoFundMe. We reported on it yesterday. She was trying to raise $75,000 for her bail. Uh, she had only hit 5000 I believe that is her right there. Um, she'd only raised $5,000 as of yesterday. And Harry we've got this uh, footage, I do believe, of Giuliani walking into the bail bondsman's office, um, which, again, humbling experience. There he is. Um, he's probably sent a lot of people, as Lisa pointed out, to have to do the same thing. Uh, this is a man who's been brought low. Uh, the only person who I think could be brought even lower experiencing this would be Donald Trump himself. We have all had a front row seat to Elon Musk going off the rails this year as he continues to drive the site formerly known as Twitter into the ground. It's been a dangerous game to watch with someone so volatile in charge of a major source of information and political discourse. But his influence on U.S. policy goes far beyond that, ranging from space to energy to even funding Ukrainian soldiers access to the Internet. As Ronan Fowler reports in The New Yorker, there is little precedent for a civilian becoming the arbiter of a war between nations in such a granular way, or for the degree of dependency that the U.S. now has on Musk in a variety of fields. In the past 20 years, against a backdrop of crumbling infrastructure and declining trust in institutions, Musk has sought out business opportunities in crucial areas where, after decades of privatization, the state has receded. The government is now reliant on him, but struggles to respond to his risk-taking, brinksmanship, and caprice. Ronan Farrow, investigative reporter and contributing writer for The New Yorker, joins me now. And uh, Ronan, so great to see it's you. It's always a pleasure, Joy. Uh, even though you just scared the hell out of me with this piece. I'm sorry. Well, I, and I love you for reading that whole long tract, because it, it, we were talking about this in the break. This is a piece that is about those big themes, not just the scoop. So I, I really appreciate your highlighting that in a thoughtful Well, it's, the Starlink thing is particularly frightening. OK, so this is, you know, essentially he controls the access to the Internet that Ukraine depends on to survive in, a, in the midst of a war. And he seems to be becoming pro-Putin and against continuing to help. Why is the United States government dependent on him for that? Why is Ukraine dependent on him? As in so many of the areas I write about in this piece, the answer embodies a mix of pros and cons that it plays out across this story. You have the pro of Elon Musk identifying in a really canny way an area of government underinvestment and right. getting there first and putting his personal resources into it and bringing his no holds barred uh, progress at any cost, uh, risks to human lives, his own and those of others be damned philosophy to right. it. And in the case of Starlink, his satellite system, that is, as you say, providing the backbone of communication in Ukraine as yeah. they need that communication for both civilian and military purposes to literally coordinate and defend themselves. Uh, 
he did get there first on this kind of private satellite business model uh, and this kind of mobile station to connect to that network. And, you know, I, I talked to NASA officials who warned that we're going to see even more dependence on him in this area because he's filled so many of the orbits of the Earth with right. his satellites that he is just going to be an ongoing, if you'll forgive the phrase, center of gravity yeah. in this world. Let, let me read the scariest line. I want to read the scariest line in the whole piece. SpaceX is currently the sole means by which NASA transports crew from U.S. soil into space. And then you name a bunch of other agencies, which you could go on uh, the, you know, the, the Federal Aviation Administration, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and on and on. Even the chargers that the Biden administration is depending on for this electric car. It's all him. Yeah, he has 60 percent of the charging stations for electric vehicles in this country right now. So any green energy policy is going to have to revolve around and, and work with him in significant ways. None of this is black and white and simple. There are competitors in all these spaces. NASA is saying, look, we're trying and we hope in a year Boeing is going to be able to do some of these things. But it, historians told me this state of affairs where we're sort of scrambling and trying to find any alternatives at all in yeah. so many areas with respect to one person, that's new. And is he stable? Because you talk about ketamine here, you talk about some behavior, you know, talk, telling his wife, I'm the alpha and not that let marriage not lasting long. Is he stable? Well, you know, while I think the bigger warnings in this story are about the systems of modern capitalism that concentrate so much power and wealth in so few, there's also a, a fair set of warnings about Elon Musk that some people close to him are sounding. And in a way, he is a perfect illustration of those bigger themes, Joy, because there is so much to be said about the ways in which he has pushed progress meaningfully, right. and we have benefited from that. But also, he is a figure that makes it difficult to rely on him. He is subject to erratic turns. We have seen him slip into political radicalism uh, in a way that you know, I think people fairly find hurtful and destructive to other human beings. His own daughter is a, a, a trans individual, and he has really descended hard into anti-trans sentiment on Twitter. That's just one of many examples. He's spreading a lot of misinformation. He is trolling people in a way that is very rooted in alt-right vernacular, calling people pedophiles all the time. Yeah. So, so you, you take a guy with this much power who is talking openly about his sadness, his isolation, his loneliness, uh, who is, as you say... Um, you know, known and reported to be using a variety of different substances that can contribute to erraticism, even though, I should caution, many of those can also be used in healthy, medically sure. prescribed ways. Uh, there are people around him who are concerned. And then we as a nation, and indeed as a world, have to be concerned because wars depend on him. Yeah. Major policies depend on him. The, the thing I think that is the bigger picture, and I want to come back to that because I think it's an important point you make, you know, this country has been through periods where we've over depended on very rich men to fund the government, to do things the government should be doing. How many other Elon Musks are controlling a lot of our what should be government functions? I'm glad that you mentioned that because this story about Elon Musk, like most of the stories I'm drawn to, is not about one person. Right. You're absolutely right. There is a billionaire set right now of hyper-wealthy well, hyper individuals who are less prominent than Musk. And because they are less colorful, they are pulling the strings in all sorts of significant ways. Now, Elon Musk is unique in the number of industries that he has this influence over and presents unique problems. Yeah. But you're right to highlight he's not alone. Uh, scary stuff, but I really recommend everyone read this. Uh, Ronan Farrow, thank you Thanks, for Joy. the great work that you do. It's so important in letting us in on the scary stuff. We need to know. Scaring is scary. I got you. Thanks. Thank you very much.